Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Sunshine Menezes, and I'm very happy to have you join us today for Metcalf Institute's latest webinar, The Optimist's Telescope, a conversation with Bina Venkatraman. I am the executive director of Metcalf Institute, and I'm very pleased to have you join us today. Our speaker today is going to share insights from her book, The Optimist's Telescope, about how we can use long-term thinking to help us forge a better future. You'll hear Bina's full bio in a moment, but I'm proud to note that she is an alumna of Metcalf Institute's training for journalists and a former member of our advisory board. Metcalf Institute's mission is to engage diverse audiences in conversations about science and the environment through webinars like this, and by providing education, training, and resources for journalists, for scientists, and other science communicators. We would like to thank our donors for making this webinar possible. And I'd also like to note that we're presenting this webinar in partnership with the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. IBIS, as it's known, at Brown University, is a program that tackles urgent environmental challenges by harnessing academic excellence from many disciplines, climatology and sociology, ecology and international relations, finance and artistic expression. I should note that Bina is also a Brown alum. Now I'm thrilled to introduce the moderator for today's discussion, and that is David Boardman. In addition to being another old friend of Metcalf Institute's, David is Dean of the Klein College of Media and Communication at Temple University in Philadelphia. He chairs the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, the Lenfest Institute for Journalism, and the Solutions Journalism Network. And he serves on several other boards, he's quite busy, including the American Society of News Editors Foundation and the Fund for Investigative Journalism, among others. Previously, he was executive editor and senior vice president of the Seattle Times, the largest news organization in the Pacific Northwest. Under his leadership, the Times won four Pulitzer Prizes and produced 10 Pulitzer finalists. It was in this role that David first began working with Metcalf Institute as a juror and ultimately jury chair of the Grantham Prize. David has received many national awards for his journalism and leadership, including the National Ethics Award from the Society of Professional Journalists, the Goldsmith Prize in Investigative Reporting from Harvard University, the Worth Bingham Prize in Investigative Reporting, the Investigative Reporters and Editors Award, and the Associated Press Managing Editors Public Service Award. I could say a lot more about David, but that would take up too much time. So for now, I'm happy to turn the conversation over to David Boardman to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Sunshine. Um, my association with you and with the Metcalf Institute really has been one of the joys of my career. The work that you have done and continue to do has enriched the profession of journalism uh, for the benefit of our readers and our viewers and our listeners. So, so thanks so much. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation. One of the most profound impacts that Metcalf has had, of course, is in um, the training program, the fellowship program for mid-career journalists. And certainly one of the most stellar graduates of the, that program is our speaker uh, here today, uh, Bina Venkantraman. Bina's resume is, in a word, breathtaking. I'll do the short version here, or it would chew up the half, at least half the hour that we have. Bina is, of course, an author. She's a science policy expert, and she's a journalist, currently the editorial page editor of one of America's greatest newspapers, the Boston Globe. She formerly served as senior advisor for climate change innovation in the Obama White House, where she also advised the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. She was the Director of Global Policy Initiatives at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT and continues to teach at MIT. She's an alumna of Brown and Harvard's Kennedy School and the recipients, a recipient of various awards and fellowships, including, of course, the Metcalf Fellowship. Most notably, she's from a small town in Northeast Ohio, as am I, go Cleveland Browns. Um, what we'll be talking about most today is Bina's book, The Optimist Telescope, Thinking Ahead in a Reckless Age. It was named a best book of 2019 by the Financial Times, Amazon, and National Public Radio. It is, I can attest, a fascinating read that's become even more relevant and meaningful in the months since its publication. Heaven knows that after last night's televised debacle, or as Dana Bash on CNN called it, the SHIT show, we could certainly use some palate cleansing optimism today. Um, Bina will share some of the ideas she presents in her book 
and then I will start us off in a conversation in which you'll all be invited to participate. So please join me using the now popular Zoom wave in welcoming our esteemed speaker, Bina Venkatraman. Thank you so much, uh, David. It's such an honor to be interviewed by you, which we'll get to, I know, after I say a few things about the book. And it's such a pleasure to talk with all of you today. Even though I can't see your faces, I'm imagining you and your interest in this topic. And that does give me uh, a sense of cap palate cleansing as well after last night. And I do want to thank Sunshine Menezes, uh, the Metcalf Institute, University of Rhode Island, and IBIS at Brown uh, for hosting this today. I, I'm deeply grateful to all of you. And Sunshine is right that I was a Metcalf Fellow uh, now 11, 12 years ago. And at that point was on the health and science desk of the Boston Globe, to which I've returned now. Uh, so everything comes full circle. Uh, and David, I'm looking forward to our conversation. I uh, have admired your career for a very long time uh, from afar, and it's, uh, it's just a delight to, to get to exchange ideas with you at this sort of crucial moment in American history and pivotal moment for the world, really. So I want to just acknowledge uh, what, I, what might be an elephant in the Zoom room, so to speak, which is that it might seem strange to talk about long-term thinking at a time of such urgent crisis. So, uh, just from the personal level, I know virtually everyone I know is going through some sort of trauma because of the pandemic, whether it's being separated from loved ones, losing people to COVID, uh, losing jobs, losing benefits, uh, losing childcare. Uh, and so when we have a lot of immediate demands on our attention, on our bandwidth, on our resources, that actually is uh, a barrier to long-term thinking. Uh, it can be an inherent barrier to long-term thinking, which is one of the ideas I talk about of many in the Optimist Telescope. But I also want to posit that long-term thinking at a time when the near future looks very murky, when we don't know what's going to happen on election day, when we don't know when this pandemic is going to abate, when we'll have a vaccine, uh, when we have that kind of anxiety about the near-term future, that casting our gaze a little bit further, imagining uh, a time frame that we don't usually allow ourselves to escape to, can actually be a form of relief and maybe even uh, anchoring and, uh, in fact, uh, comforting. So uh, in that spirit, I'm going to start not with the major findings of my book, but with a small exercise that I just want to take about two minutes to do, and then we'll jump into sort of three of the major insights from the book and then have the conversation. Uh, and so what I would invite you to do is take a few moments to imagine yourself or a child or godchild or niece or nephew or grandchild 20 or 25 years from now. So try to populate an image of where you are in this moment, 20 or 25 years from now, where the child is 20 or 25 years from now. What does it look like? What does the person look like? What do the surroundings look like? The neighborhood, the community? Think it through a little bit. And then come up with, and if you want to jot this down on paper, great. If you want to just keep it in your head, that's great too. Think about what you would tell this person about this time you're living in right now, what's going on in your life, what's going on in the country, what's going on in the world, and how you would, how you might imagine explaining how you got through this time, how we got through this time to this future person. Okay, with that, I'm gonna be quiet for a few moments and just invite you all to either close your eyes or, or uh, jot some things down on paper with that prompt.
Okay, with the acknowledgement that that was probably not nearly enough time, uh, because usually this exercise can take quite a bit of time, it could take half an hour, and one way to flesh it out would be to actually take the points that you came up with and write a letter to your future self to be open in the future or to your future child, grandchild, niece, nephew, someone important in your life. And this is an exercise uh, doing what some behavioral economists call perspective taking. So it involves putting yourself in the shoes of a future imagined person, a person with a specific role, and uh, being able to sort of bridge that gap that we have between the present and the future. And for most people, the future is not easy to conjure in our minds. The fact that we conjure the future at all is kind of miraculous, and it's probably unique to humans and maybe a couple of other animals, uh, the corvids, uh, the ravens and crows that seem to have some promising future planning capabilities. But humans seem to be the best at this. It's the reason that we sowed seeds for later harvests, uh, thinking about how planting seeds now could lead to later harvest the agricultural revolution arose from that. It's why we have cities. It's why we imagined going to the moon and then went there as a species. So the, the fact that we can do that uh, is both a talent of humans, but also something that's very difficult to do. If you think of all the sensory input you get in the present, you can see that donut on the counter that you want to eat right now. You can smell it. You can almost taste it. And then when you take it, you can taste it. When you see something you want to buy, you can see it right in front of you and take it in with your senses. And the future, by contrast, is a figment of our imaginations. We have to be able to make an imaginative leap, a cognitive leap, in order to take it seriously, bring it into our uh, present uh, considerations and to value it accordingly. And that's one of the reasons why uh, surveys show of people across hundreds of countries that uh, most people struggle or don't tend to think about the future past about 15 years. They tend to focus on the very immediate future. What's gonna to happen tomorrow? What's gonna to happen next week? Maybe what's gonna happen an hour from now? And this kind of exercise in perspective taking is one gap, way to bridge that gap. And I think of it as a way to bridge the gap of imaginative empathy. And this is important, imaginative empathy, not just for uh, being able to think about your own future dreams and your future plans or how you wanna be remembered by a future person you might write a letter to, but it's important for saving for the future. Can we imagine ourselves in retirement? Can we imagine ourselves down the road? It's important for companies. Can we imagine risks uh, that we might be taking now? Uh, can we imagine how they might play out for the company, not just in immediate profits, but in scenarios that could happen down the road? It's important for society. Can we imagine what it's like to not act in time on a pandemic, to not act in time on climate change? Or by contrast, to actually act to avert disaster. Can we imagine that reality? Bridging that gap of imaginative empathy is a lot easier when we can attach people to it. So this is just one of the exercises and ideas that I talk about in the Optimist Telescope, but it's sort of the driving force behind the book, which is how do we bridge the gap between our scientific knowledge about the future, predictions of the future, which are becoming more and more, more robust in certain arenas with all of our uh, sophisticated data science, uh, with our work of modeling. Uh, how do we bridge the gap of that between that knowledge of what we should and could do for our future, for our own future and for our world's future, with the ability to make decisions in the present? And so that's kind of what drove me to write the book. And, and it, a major animating reason for that, of course, was my work on climate change in the Obama administration and the desire to see the science of climate change uh, be acted on by people in government, by people in communities, by our society, and by, by our governments as well. So I want to share with you, for your own use in your life, your own thinking, just three of the insights from the book, and then we'll move to the conversation uh, with David. And one of the major insights about how we do this, how we bridge this gap between uh, imagination of the future and what's right in front of us in the present is to mind what we measure. One of the stories I tell in the book is about uh, communities in South India, which were receiving lots of microfinance loans to ostensibly lift people out of poverty, lift women out of poverty, and therefore lift families out of generations of poverty. Well, the lenders were using a very um, meaningful metric for the short term, which was the loan repayment rate of these women of the loans. Uh, to decide that they were successful and that this industry was thriving and that people were being lifted out of poverty. It turned out that that rate, even though it was really high, about 97 to 99 percent, was masking bigger risks in the system, 
Uh, women were taking out multiple loans just to pay off the formal lenders. Uh, women were uh, banded together in groups, shaming each other for falling back on their loans because the collective had to make up for the individual who fell back on their loans. And there was a major collapse, a bubble burst uh, of the microcredit industry in India in, in 2010. Uh, there was a rash of suicides among women vi villagers. This is a very dire and dark story, but we see the way this plays out in our daily lives as well. Uh, when we focus just on what's in our inboxes, just on replying to those text messages, meeting immediate deadlines in the news industry, which David and I are, have been in, uh, we can often neglect those longer term uh, bigger opportunities to make a difference, whether that's a big project that's going to win you one of the ma many prizes David has won as a journalist, or uh, a risk uh, like the financial collapse, the financial crisis that happened here in the US. The second insight I will share is to pick up the tools to think ahead. So in the Optimist Telescope, I write about a number of tools that bridge this gap between what we sense in the present and value in the present and what we can imagine in the future. I write about role play games that are used at the Pentagon that have, that have also been used to plan for uh, future earthquakes, future tsunamis, to help people really get a sense of what decisions they should make uh, in order to plan for disaster. I sh um, shared with you the idea of writing a letter to your future self. Uh, this is a behavioral economist named Tricia Shrum, who um, is at the University of Vermont and her daughter, Eleanor. Uh, Tricia and a colleague uh, started an initiative called Dear Tomorrow, where they invite uh, people to write letters to be opened in the year 2050 by children or by their future selves. And it's drawing on this research uh, that shows that taking the perspective of a future person can help people take more seriously the risks of climate change and commit to actions today that might actually change uh, that future for that future person that they're imagining. The third and final insight I want to share um, is to commit to a shared heirloom in order to bridge this imagination gap for the future. So many of us have heirlooms in our families. We have furniture. I have a, um, a special instrument I inherited from my great grandfather that sort of was the anchoring reason that I um, thought about this as a metaphor for what we need to do as a society more collectively uh, for our future. Uh, but we don't tend to think about heirlooms in a shared sense. And that is, I think, one of the most powerful ways that we can come together in society and collectives to act right by the future, to take seriously the future. It's very difficult to imagine people generations from now, what kind of clothes they're gonna wear, what kind of technologies they're gonna use. Think of the rapid change that's happened just in your lifetime. Um, I certainly didn't have a smartphone in my pocket when I was growing up. I remember dial up AOL from when I was in high school, uh, but society has rapidly changed uh, because of technology, because of the way culture changes, because of our globalized world and the way that uh, we spread ideas. So it's difficult to imagine, say, people many generations down the line, but we can imagine, as you did when you thought about that person you were writing to 25 years from now, about a generation ahead. And that's the kind of thinking that we use when we give heirlooms. We think about the passing something to the next generation that the next generation can then, then steward to the subsequent generations. I'll give you an example of this from the book. Uh, I wrote about um, a group of eight communities in Western Mexico on the Baja uh, Peninsula, where uh, they have come together and told a different kind of fish story. They have protected their lobster fishery uh, against overfishing over the course of decades now, and did so by thinking of it as a resource and a way of life that they want to pass to each generation. Instead of overfishing it, they are protecting that lobster by measuring what they catch, by policing their, their fishery um, from intruders that might overfish the lobster, and really passing down that practice uh, to their sons and grandsons in this case. Uh, we have a very good example, a powerful example of a shared heirloom uh, in the US, which is our national park system. We, in each generation, create meaning for that park system when each generation goes to visit the Grand Canyon or Yosemite or Acadia. We, in that way, engage with the heirloom in each generation, but we also have a set of resources, funding, and we have a sort of governance structure. We have laws that protect these areas for each generation. And that's a way to, instead of say, let's bury a time capsule for the future and do something for the future, let's actually pass something on among us that is a, a, a form of a shared resource and something that we can do with far more resources than we do today. So I'm gonna stop there just so we can have the conversation with David and, and we can actually answer some of your questions. But those are just a few of the ideas that I think are important from the book 
that I think can get us past, um, past the sort of short term focus that I think dominates a lot of our lives. Oh, David, you're on mute. So we, uh, the, the curse of our time, you're on mute. Um, thank you, Bina. And, and again, I'll start us off with a few questions. And while the two of us are talking, um, I invite and encourage the rest of you to begin to put your questions in the Q&A, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, and Sunshine will help me manage those. Um, Bina, I truly love this book. Um, first, please tell us what led you to write The Optimist Telescope. It, it's, it's a rather complex and not particularly obvious topic. It's not like Donald Trump versus the United States or Bob Woodward's rage. What, what was your muse? What led you to do this? A partly frustration and partly curiosity. Uh, so it started with my work uh, in the Obama White House. My, a lot of my work was involved, um, was focused on taking the science of climate change and trying to share it with communities and companies and everyday citizens, uh, hoping that when people have the information, when they're armed with the information, and this is something Sunshine and Metcalf can really appreciate, that they will make the best decisions, right? That they would make the best decisions. So sitting down with Fortune 500 CEOs, sharing with them information about projected droughts through the Midwest, thinking, okay, this information really hits at their supply chain. If they're a food company that's growing um, soybeans in, in the Midwest, we, they're gonna really care about this information about the changing climate, about heat waves and droughts uh, or floods. Um, but then finding that even with people who are very well informed, not people who deny the science, but people who actually believe in the science of climate change could take it seriously, could say, look, I understand what you're saying. These threats are coming down the road. Uh, they were struggling to actually make decisions because of their shareholders. If it was a CEO, the shareholders wanted to make sure that they had returns by the quarter, by the year, and weren't so focused on those risks beyond a sort of five-year time horizon. Now, we know, so this was 2013 and 2014 when I was doing this work. We know now that some of these risks are not so far away. We see California on fire. Uh, we see the hurricanes hitting the Gulf Coast. So it's not so future oriented as it was to present these predictions seven years ago, uh, but it's still to some degree, right? The, the worst impacts of climate change are still to come, right? They're still in the future. They're not right here in the present. And so I would get, I would sort of feel like I was hitting my head against the wall, trying to present the science, trying to help people support them to make decisions, whether it's elevating your house, if you live in New Orleans or, or just um, you know, making a better decision as a mayor about which, whether you're gonna develop that floodplain or not. And finding that um, that barrier was always coming up, that people struggle to think ahead, that they're not rewarded for thinking ahead. All of those incentives are not lined up right if you wanna use sort of the economics term. Uh, but then, you know, really asking myself, I, I think there was a temptation to become cynical about that and, and to say, well, that's just human nature. That's just the way we are, right? We're just not capable of thinking ahead. Uh, but I got really curious about that question. And especially when I left government and sort of returned to my, what is I think of as my core identity as a journalist and a writer, uh, I really wanted to probe the question, is it is it true that it's impossible in human nature to think ahead? Because look at these feats. We have put people on the moon. We have, um, you know, radically changed landscapes into cities. That all involved imagining the future and planning ahead. So what is it that allows us to think ahead and what is it that gets in the way? And so the book is really an exploration of that and really a call to claim the tools that actually will help us think ahead. So on that, that uh, species, uh, ability of what you call the superpower of mental time travel. You know, why, why don't we use that capacity better more often? And I'm, I was really fascinated, share what's been learned about that human capacity um, from the, the old marshmallow tests that a lot of us are familiar with and, and the subsequent study of those toddlers as, as they grew up and, and the cultural aspects too, I found really surprising. Right, yeah, this was one of the, the delicious findings of the book, um, if you will, since we're talking about marshmallows. Um, but that there's this experiment that a lot of people have probably heard of, the marshmallow test, which was given uh, by Stanford researcher Walter Michel, the late uh, psychologist uh, in the 60s to toddlers, where they had the choice between eating a treat right away, a marshmallow, pretzel, or cookie, their treat of choice, or waiting for a second treat for an indefinite period of time. So you don't know when you're gonna get the second treat and you've just gotta sit there as a toddler, which anyone who's met a toddler knows how hard that is. 
And they followed those toddlers later in life and found that they were more likely if they had waited for the second treat to have high SAT scores, uh, higher college graduation rates, even higher earnings. So they found this correlation uh, uh, between what the kids did when they're young and how they did when they were older. And there was a lot of mythology that emerged around these findings. And you can find TED Talks about it. It was on Sesame Street. And the mythology was there are certain people who are good at thinking ahead and that that's kind of figured out when you're young. And if you aren't one of those kids that waits for the second marshmallow, you're kind of just cursed to being short-sighted and you're going to have this kind of life of not achieving much because you can't resist gratification and you don't think ahead. I'm painting this in broad brushstrokes. But the reality is that the studies that have been done that have tried to replicate the marshmallow test, and there have been hundreds of studies done by all different manner of psychologists. And Walter Michel, even before he died, wrote a book really documenting that this was a much more complicated picture. It was not the case that people were just doomed or um, gifted with the talent of thinking ahead and waiting. Uh, that it was actually something that could be influenced by environment, it could be influenced by conditions, and even by culture. And so some of the surprising studies have shown, for example, that when you have a kid in a peer group where all the kids are wearing red t-shirts and you point to the kids wearing red t-shirts and the kid that you're going to put in the experiment is wearing a red t-shirt and you say to the kid, um, all the kids with the red t-shirt waited for the second marshmallow. The kid is more likely to wait for the second marshmallow. They're being reinforced. There's a cultural norm there, a peer norm to wait for the second marshmallow. Uh, you referenced the cultural differences. People will often say, well, it's great. It's a luxury to think ahead that it's not something that people who are in poverty can do. It's not something that people um, who are too busy can do. And there is definitely truth to that. It becomes harder in scarcity to think ahead and value the future. If you're trying to put food on the table tonight, you don't have as much time to help your kids with their homework that's going to help them pass that test two weeks from now or a year from now. But uh, one of the surprising uh, instances of the marshmallow test uh, was when it was given to the kids of subsistence farmers in Cameroon who uh, consistently among, across hundreds of kids passed this test with a local treat called a puff puff. It's like a donut. Uh, they passed the test at much higher rates, like 70% of the kids waited for the second treat compared to German and American toddlers. It tends to be around 30 to 40% of kids who wait. And so there, it suggests a powerful role of culture uh, in delaying gratification, in valuing future rewards, and being able to imagine the future consequence uh, being better than what you can get in the here and now. And so I think there's a lot we can learn uh, from that research. It's not the whole story. It fits into a picture, though, of countless examples that I write about in the book and, and stories from how doctors prescribe antibiotics, to um, how people plan for, um, for floods, th that, that it is possible to actually reinforce these norms. It is possible to create a culture within, is, if it's your company or your nonprofit or your university classroom, uh, or it's your peer group of friends uh, where you value the future more. And it might be as simple as you come together and you all write letters to your future selves um, you know, once a month and you bring that into your practice and reinforce that because we know we're all getting reinforcement for the other, the other way of doing things. So one of the things that I think is great about the book is, I mean, you really give not only a variety of examples, but you, you really equip us with some tools on, on how to do this. And, and in the context of the, what you want now is a craving, what, when we try to bring that to the future, it's a much more cerebral exercise. And you, you talk about um, some very low tech ways of doing that, like you just talked about with writing the letter or had you, uh, as you had us close our eyes and envision at the beginning, you also talk about some technological tools that are that are emerging that will help us do this. So would, would you speak to that? Sure. One of the ways that I probed this question was by going to the Stanford Virtual Reality Lab and uh, getting to experience uh, for one, swimming in a coral reef, a virtual coral reef uh, that was to to simulate coral reefs in the year 2100, if the current trajectory of the oceans acidifying from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that is making, um, as one report called it, the oceans hot, sour, and breathless, the, that trend uh, is going to bleach out and kill coral reefs if we don't change it. So I swam in a vibrant coral reef today in virtual reality, and then it flash forwarded the year 2100, and all the colorful fish disappeared. It was pretty sad. 
Uh, so studies that have been done by Jeremy Balenson at Stanford have shown that when people swim in this virtual coral reef in present and future reality, this is, they sustain for longer concern over coral reefs uh, than people who watch a documentary about coral reef destruction or who read a paragraph about its destruction. And one of the insights here, I also looked at um, a study that where people look at virtual reality avatars of themselves in older age. And so they can wave at themselves as if you're waving in a mirror at an aged version of yourself. And for people who are curious about this, there are apps that do this, but just a cautionary note, some of those apps, the data are harvested by uh, companies in or, or potential hackers in Russia. So just be careful if you are going to use one of these aging apps to check it out first. Uh, I used one called Aging Booth, which I don't think is one of those. Um, and I put, put in a, a flattering picture of myself and then I got to see an aged picture of myself. I think it was probably, you know, maybe 75, 80 years old or something, if you had to guess what age um, it spit out. And uh, the idea is, again, that it's not enough just to give people information about the future. There is a way in which we need to have a visceral sensory experience of the future. We need to be able to imagine the future, even feel in our guts to take it as seriously as what we take in the present. And uh, these experiments in virtual reality, because they provide sensory input, um, they can actually make you feel something about the future that you might not feel in your gut uh, just by reading a report about um, the way the oceans are changing or just by being told, you know, you really ought to save for your retirement. And in that um, avatar experiment uh, that I referenced uh, where people, college kids were looking at old age versions of themselves in virtual reality and waving back and forth. And uh, it, sh it was shown by in this study that Hal Hirschfield at UCLA did that, that those uh, young people who had that experience, that encounter with the older version of themselves, again, were more likely to express a willingness to save for their future. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, as you know, a major focus of the Metcalf Institute is how journalists can effectively report on climate change in a way that both gets people's attention and, and, and frankly alarms them to some degree and at the same time um, leaves them feel, feeling empowered and, and not just paralyzed. Um, in the context of your work, um, would you give us journalists some advice on how to do that more effectively, please? Well, I think one of the things I think about, because I obviously have to grapple with this myself in, in trying to steer our coverage, is we often, um, I think we're really good at, in, journal, in journalism at painting a picture of a negative future, of what happens when you don't do something about ocean acidification, for example. We can say, here's how the coral reefs will look. They're already dying out now. We can document the facts on the ground. I think what is often missing uh, from, from that kind of future-oriented journalism is a sense of where the points of agency are. So uh, the points of change, uh, how can whatever decisions are made by me, by my community, by the lawmakers I elect, uh, by politicians, by companies, how might they affect and change this scenario of the future? Because the future, you, you don't have to believe the future is bright and that's not my form of optimism. I don't believe the future is necessarily going to be good. Um, hard to think that these days. What I do think is that the future is changeable and that it's changeable through decisions we make. And that's the piece of it. That's the story that's harder to tell, I think, but I think it's a really important story for journalists to get behind. And one way to anchor that, so um, Metcalf does a lot of really interesting work with journalists and training journalists. And one of the things I love about the way that the Institute works, which is a credit to the scientists who are you know, collaborating with the journalists, is that there's an opportunity to look at what, for example, um, is being documented as solutions. What kind of, uh, what, what are scientists doing to kind of get at the sort of wonder and curiosity about that scientists have about the world even as it's changing. So there is a sense of fear and doom, but there's also a sense of how does this actually work? Like why is Narragansett Bay changing in this way? And um, scientists bring that kind of, um, I guess I would say the ability to understand the future, not only through the lens of doom and dread, but through the lens of curiosity. And I think that's, that's another way 
to get people to not just say, I'm so alarmed by and so afflicted by everything that's in the news. I'm just going to turn away from this because this one's in the future. This climate stuff's in the future. I'm too worried about the election. I'm too worried about the pandemic right now. Um, but let me read this really interesting story. If it's either about a possible path forward, someone who's pioneering a solution somewhere that might be replicable and or a scientist who's curious about a question. Great. Well, I'm happy to see we're getting some questions, so I'll turn to those uh, soon. Um, I wanted to ask, so as we were reminded last night, um, once again, you know, we live in one of the most starkly divided periods in our history. Yet one of the, the really fascinating points you make is that it's important to bring together people who openly disagree as we make plans for the future. Well, why is that and, and how do we do it? So important and so difficult these days um, as, you know, I, I don't know if last night's debate was an example of that or just an extreme <laughs> outlier of some other world of discourse that I don't even understand. Um, still trying to figure that one out. But, um, but one of the examples I write about in the book is uh, when uh, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy brought together his XCOM, which was this committee uh, helping him make decisions around the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was that 13 harrowing days when Khrushchev and Kennedy were kind of in this game theory uh, standoff with the missiles that had been placed by Russia and Cuba just 90 miles from, um, from Florida, from the American coastline. And the lesson that Kennedy had learned from the failed Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba was that he needed to have more diverse voices or people in the room, people who would disagree in the room. And he also needed to remove himself as the leader from the room so people could openly disagree even with his perspective. Now, diverse in the parlance of the 1960s is very different than how we think of <laughs> diverse today. Right. So of course it was still a group of white men who were all kind of from a certain kind of training and you know the kind of people who were in the White House in, in sort of the administration. Maybe a Catholic or two, right? Yeah, right, maybe a Catholic <laughs> or two. But they came from different ideologies uh, in terms of hawks and doves, uh, in terms of um, not just Russianists, but people who were experts in Asia. So. The idea being you want to bring people who have different life experiences, uh, different perspectives together if you want to enrich your understanding of what possible scenarios could happen in the future. So one of the um, pitfalls, common pitfalls of scenario planning in groups that happens for the future, I write about the Munich Olympics as an example of this, is that people will tend to sanitize scenarios of the future that they don't want to happen. So you might present them with a future that you think is really realistic. In the case of the Munich Olympics, the, the actual scenario of a terrorist attack, which is what happened there in 1972, was presented to the Olympic organizers. But because they so desperately didn't want that to happen, they decided not to plan for it. And it, it sounds ridiculous, but it happens all the time in scenario planning. People will pick the scenario they most like, and they will plan for that. And they'll kind of tune out and dismiss as less likely other viable scenarios. And so one of the things that having a diverse group of people can do is, again, you're giving voice to those scenarios. You're creating an empathetic person in the room. It's not just research that says the scenario could happen. It's an actual person who plays a role in advocating for that potential future and that reality. And that's harder to turn away from. Um, yeah, I could go on, but I'll leave it there. All right, so um, I'm, I'm going to dip into these very fine questions that are coming uh, from the audience. Um, someone who is not named uh, asks, and this is, this is quite fitting after what you just talked about, you mentioned that the future is not fixed. Can you speak about how our understanding of history affects our view of the future? We often tell history as an inevitable path, failing to see the forks taken or the alternatives we turned away from. How can we rethink, relearn history to see the potential of the future? I love this question and it's perfectly, perfectly uh, poised at this moment uh, because I was just talking about the example of the Munich Olympics. So first a cautionary tale about the use of history and then I'll come back to the use of history which is so critical and so important for how we think about the future. So the cautionary tale is that uh, one of the reasons that the Olympic organizers in Germany in 1972 dismissed uh, the very realistic scenario of the terrorist attack that was predicted for them by Georg Sieber, who was a police psychologist at the time advising them, was that there was this kind of trap from history, if you look back at how, how people were thinking at the time, that the last time that Germany had 
hosted the Olympic Games was in 1936 when Hitler presided over them. And there was this real desire to rebrand because that had been such a militaristic, morose Olympics to rebrand the, ger the next German Olympic Games as cheerful. So they were literally called the cheerful carefree games, die Heitrenspiele. Uh, um, and they had this, you know, uh, dachshund named Waldi who was the like mascot of the games. And there was a real desire to keep military and police presence minimal. And so there was no security guards on the perimeter of the Olympic fence of the Olympic um, village, the fence that was protecting the athletes at night. And, and one of the reasons why the Israeli athletes were so easily targeted by people who just frankly climbed over the fence, simply, simply avoided some barbed wire and um, took hostage these athletes. Now, so uh, the reason I told the story in the book and I'm saying it now is that sometimes it is, it is very well documented actually that our most recent experiences are the ones that become the most salient for us in projecting future possible pitfalls or disasters. So um, right after hurricanes and earthquakes, you will see people uh, in those particular regions go and buy earthquake insurance and uh, hurt flood insurance. And then as time goes on, uh, this has happened in California recently. You see a lot of areas of California where people have basically decided, I don't need that earthquake insurance anymore because, you know, 1991 was the last time we had a big earthquake. And the reality is that as time goes on, the likelihood of a bigger, more catastrophic disaster is actually going up, not going down. But because it isn't recent in memory, people will uh, abandon those plans. By contrast, they'll sometimes over-insure for the most recent disaster that they've experienced or they'll overcompensate for whatever that recent memory, uh, salient memory is. So, so that's the cautionary tale. And, and the upshot, the sort of way we need to use history um, is, is that it's another form of providing a more diverse range of scenarios and more enriched sense of what's possible in the future. So uh, one of the stories I tell in the book and in this TED talk I was lucky enough to give last year, um, which feels like it was in an alternate reality because it was in a room full of all these people, um, <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> this nice um, intimate conversation on Zoom. And um, it was uh, about this civil engineer who, um, was responsible for the nuclear power station in Onagawa, Japan. Uh, so Onagawa, for those who don't know, uh, when the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami struck Japan uh, was uh, a, um, very affected. It was closer to the epicenter of the earthquake, um, the city itself. But the nuclear power plant there, unlike the nuclear power plant in Fukushima, uh, was uh, untouched. The gym was actually a place of refuge for people in Onagawa. They fled to the gym during the disaster. And one of the reasons that Onagawa's nuclear power station was so much more safe, despite being closer to the epicenter of the earthquake versus to Fukushima Daiichi, which we know that nuclear power plant flooded, the seawall was breached, um, there was meltdown of three reactors. The reason that Onagawa was safer is that it had been built further back from the coast at a higher elevation and with a higher seawall than was originally proposed and also then Fukushima. And the engineer behind pushing for that, uh, his name was Yanusuke Hirai, and his rationale at the time was that he knew the story of the uh, Jogan earthquake of the year 869. So talk about reaching back into history uh, uh, by millennia. And and it had that story of the flood of his hometown shrine had stayed with him and he carried that story and he thought about a uh, potential for a tsunami to come and flood this nuclear power plant so he didn't get to live he didn't live to see what happened it would have been great to interview him and ask him kind of what he thought and how what his reaction was to seeing you know that this nuclear power station actually became a haven uh, but it's, again, it's having this long range of history, whereas the models that were used, the sophisticated data-driven models that were used to uh, calculate risks that could uh, happen for TEPCO, the company that owned Fukushima, those models didn't look back far enough. They didn't look back far enough to account for a sort of one in thousand year event. 
at the same time, I mean, we have lots of examples, and you touch on this in the book too, of of people just repeatedly ignoring the near-term past, and, and particularly building in floodplains, which they continue to do again and again and again in the southeast. What, where does policy come in to that, and you know, how do we disincentivize that sort of thing? Yeah, so this is really important because uh, it can, people, there are some people who um, can get confused by the, all the, I try to give people things they can do in their lives because I think it's important that we do those things. They're, it's all important and it's self, it's reinforcing if we have government take the right actions for the future and if we take the right actions and it works in a virtuous cycle. But it's not the case that, you know, you can control everything, right? Like, you know, how do, how do I control if um, the city of New Orleans decides it wants to rebuild back in those same most vulnerable floodplains or areas. Uh, so, so yes, we need government to exercise the right kind of foresight. Um, I call, you know, this collective set of tools, you know, tools for foresight, not forecasting, but actually the judgment to make good decisions about the future. And, and so had the question is, how do you get them to do that? Right? Like, how do we, how do we actually do that? And, and part of it is um, some of these tools of uh, some better kinds of scenario planning that bring more empathy into the room need to come into all levels of government. So a lot of municipal governments make these decisions about whether to develop in floodplains or not. I tell the story of Richland County in South Carolina and its decision not to develop in a high risk floodplain, which was a huge acrimonious battle basically for the soul of this community. And it pitted people against each other, but it also, created all these strange bedfellows, speaking of people who disagree coming together. You had Republican hunters coming together with environmentalists and sort of city planner types who were very nervous to basically form a political alliance to prevent this reckless development in a floodplain. And I think that can be really powerful as well, right? Like you need diverse coalitions, not just for getting ideas of what could happen in the future, but actually for being able to get the political will to do the right thing. And so, um, one of the insights here is that we need to do better at holding our politicians accountable, not just for what they're fixing for me right now, right here, but for their record. And journalists have a strong role to play in this, reminding people of what the outcome has been. And, and even just to think about this current election, you know, you're, um, you know, in the process of, of our endorsement uh, uh, for the presidency, thinking about, you know, well, on what time horizon does policy play off? When you have job growth, uh, usually that's the result of previous years, previous years of economic policy, right? So people need to have the understanding. And I think journalists can be focused a lot on the incremental, sort of what did the president say today? What's the latest tweet? Uh, we also have to do our job at helping bring context to citizens, helping bring context to voters about what politicians' past actions have done, both for good and bad. Um, we have a question from Jeff Colgan. He says, on climate change, we are not just trying to imagine the future, but also sorting out the alternative explanations for what's happening, like the president's, quote, forest management explanation for California's fire. Do you have any ideas how policymakers can bat down those flawed alternative narratives? That alternative narratives is such a good way to put that. I actually am going to make you answer this one too, David, because I'm I'm interested in your response to this. Uh, I would, uh, my sort of brief response is knowing this is complicated because we have platforms like Facebook that propagate alternative narratives, right? We have conspiracy theorists, we have all kinds of things going on, but that it's really important just for leaders in all kinds of spheres and cultural leadership and um, you know everything from Hollywood to politics to be reaffirming the narratives that actually align with the facts right what aligns with the science and to kind of keep coming back to that and helping people understand it I think there's a little bit of a danger in giving too much oxygen to those alternative narratives I know it's hard when the president of the United States is actually repeating them then we have to take them head on but, you know, sort of not assuming that there's a larger contingency for them than, than there actually is, right? There's a lot of people, the vast majority of Americans believe climate change is real, believe it's human caused, and believe it's a problem. So we actually have, right, a good critical mass. We also have an electoral college, and we have 
other kinds of problems in our politics that get in the way of acting on that. But we, it's not the case that most Americans, I think, believe this, you know, that we need to broom out the California forests. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, seed my time because <laughs> um, oh, we, no. have a question, we have a question here from one of my journalistic heroes and probably one of yours as well, um, Bob Semple. Um, the, the esteemed former New York Times uh, editorialist and, and um, who um, also served with me for many years on the Grantham Prize jury. Um, Bob asks, how does the heirloom idea apply to climate change? I would hope that we could bequeath many natural treasures to future generations. The Tongass Forest, for example, the Utah Monuments, the coral reefs, but these are particular things. Climate change is rather more vague. In other words, we somehow need to particular, particularize the threat. How beyond sharing scary pictures of dead reefs? It's great. Hi, Bob. And yes, you're right. I do I have share the admiration. Um, thanks for the question. It is like the million dollar question. Uh, I think one of the ways I think about this is, so you could write as a metaphor, you could think of the atmosphere or the oceans, these sort of broader resources as shared heirlooms. And you could say, we owe this to the next generation to keep them in at least as good of condition as we have now. There are legal theorists who talk about nature's trust. So thinking of it as the principle, you don't wanna you know, erode the principle or the endowment. You can take things that are sort of uh, the returns, but not kind of damage that fundamental principle that ought to be passed on to future generations. And I think obviously we're with what we're doing to the climate, we're far from that. So it's for some people, for maybe some financial thinkers and others, that might make sense. But I think you're absolutely right that the sense of place is what allows a lot of these heirlooms to actually uh, have meaning for people because you can't, while we all breathe in the air and we all see the atmosphere, to, to an extent, we don't really see it. We see the light, uh, but we, we, we kind of experience it in one way. We experience the climate, we experience the disasters. Uh, what we really have attachment to more are our neighborhoods, are the sense of place, the places we've been, whether that's an ocean, if you're a coastal dweller, or um, inland prairies, or whether it's the forests uh, that are on, have been on fire in California. And so I do think it is about connecting that part of caring for those heirlooms, right? Like everyone needs to establish what those heirlooms are within their sense of place and community and cultural history, how they're affected, drawing the connection between that and how protecting the climate protects those heirlooms. And how we do that, I think is still very much an open question, I think. But looking at it less as um, sort of a resource we have the right to exploit and more as something that we are indeed passing along, I think tilts the lens there a little bit, right? It's not, it's not even our right to destroy this, right? It is actually something that we're supposed to be, if we think of ourselves more as ancestors and descendants, we're supposed to be passing along. And I don't know how many people that will work for, but, uh, but I do think um, it provides a way of thinking about this that doesn't, doesn't make you responsible for everything that happens for all time, but at least makes you responsible to the next generation. Um, so before us at this very moment are these examples, just stark examples of this tension between thinking for the present and thinking for the future. Climate change, to which we've talked about, um, the coronavirus, um, and in many ways, I think Donald J. Trump. Um, but let, let's, take, let's take the coronavirus, and, and if you would give us a vision of that through the Optimist Telescope. Sure. So... I'm not sure how much optimism will be involved here, but I will get to that. I'll get to a little bit of my own source of what's changeable about the future. Again, that form of optimism that I embrace. Um, so I think the the book clearly, you know, my I made this diagnosis of why we fail to think ahead, how we fail to think ahead, and then you know the book came out in August 2019, and then we had this sort of poignant uh, unfolding of this situation in society that, you know, it's like feeling like Cassandra or something. It's like, can, can we, if people have just uh, thought ahead, we would be in a very different situation because we know that acting early in a pandemic is everything because it grows exponentially, it spreads exponentially. So the, that those initial clusters in any country, in any given country in the world uh, mattered a lot and containing it 
and educating people, testing people early on, all of that mattered a lot. And so it's been, you know, to see the political response to this from the view of the Optimus Telescope has just reinforced all of the failure modes that happen, all of the breaking points we have as a society, all the breaking points our political leaders have had when it comes to thinking ahead. And you can very clearly even map them on to some of the, the recommendations in the book. So when you're measuring yourself by the near-term stock market returns, as the president was, he didn't want to test people because he didn't want the numbers to go up. He didn't want the number to look bad in the near term, which is a near-term metric. He didn't want the stock market to go down. Uh, those near-term metrics, right, occlude a view of like, what's the actual value, right? Like what's the actual damage to the economy that's gonna come from this? What's the loss of lives we're actually gonna experience? Uh, those are more meaningful measures, right? The president is using the wrong measures for his own political purposes at that stage of the pandemic. Um, and so I'm, I'm taking this in a very political way, but it's hard not to when you think about the pandemic response from an American perspective. Uh, so, so I think from that point of view, the diagnoses of problems of why we fail to think ahead, right, so the failure points, that was reinforced by the pandemic. Uh, but in terms of sort of how do we get ourselves out of this? How do we, where do we go from here? Uh, how do we act better for the next one? I think there's so many opportunities. If you think about the the lack of mem uh, memorials to the 1918 flu pandemic, in part because it was, you know, this interwar period, uh, in part because it's hard to memorialize illness and, you know, contagion. Uh, but that really wasn't something that was marked in memory the way that there were, uh, frankly, markers of tsunamis in Japan that proved instructive for certain towns that acted wisely when it came to the tsunami of 2011. We, we could do better at at really having more historical markers of what this time has meant. Uh, we could leave better messages to the future about this time, really, if we cast our gaze again, farther than the moment we're in. And even for getting out of this particular time, we need a lot of imagination. We, we have the ab ability to imagine society being rebuilt better than it is now, right? We could imagine an economic stimulus that actually corrects racial injustices, uh, some of the racial injustices in the country. We could imagine a stimulus that deals with climate change in a very aggressive way. That scale of stimulus wasn't fathomable uh, in late 2019 when I was writing this book. People, politicians were not talking about that. And now there are trillion dollar packages being discussed and certainly depending on what happens in November, there'll be the opportunity to really remake parts of the economy because of how bad this has gotten. So I think it's about not constraining our imagination of the future now. If we just reflexively react to this crisis by you know, getting ourselves through it with whatever social distancing we can and getting people to the hospitals and getting them PPE, all of which is important, getting the vaccine, we'll be missing a huge opportunity to imagine society in a better way. And that's what I really hope we do. Yeah, I, and and I would just add, and I guess this is a, another definition of optimism. But when I when I look at the events of the last six months, it's clear that the racial and social reckoning that we are going through, which I think many of us would would uh, agree is ultimately a good thing, probably would not have happened except for the COVID nineteen crisis, or certainly not in this timing. And so that that's another way to look through the telescope and, and to think about how events, one set of events affects another set of events. Well, this has been fascinating. Again, I cannot recommend the book highly enough. And I can also recommend the audio version of it, <laughs> which is how I read about half of it as I was driving up to Boston last weekend. So- um, You must be so you know, tired of my voice, David. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Vina, and I'll hand back to Sunshine. Thank you so much for this, and thank you, David. Thank you both, um, Bina, for sharing your thoughts, especially at a moment when long-term planning is essential, but so often dangerously overlooked. And thank you, David, for leading this discussion so beautifully. It's really a treat to be able to spend time with two of my favorite people, even though we're looking at each other through little boxes. Um, on behalf of Metcalf Institute and the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society, I also thank all of you for joining us today uh, for today's conversation and for sharing your questions. Look for an email from us in the next day or so with a link to a video of this webinar. 
um, which we'll also post on Metcalf Institute's YouTube channel. And don't forget that you too can support informed public conversations uh, like this um, and about other science and environmental topics by making a donation to Metcalf Institute. In fact, tomorrow is URI's annual day of giving, which is a great time to show your support for excellent environmental journalism and inclusive science communication that addresses many of the topics we discussed here today. So you can see the link in the chat to make your gift. And um, it's been wonderful to have you all here. Thanks for sharing your time with us. Take care.